All right, go to 1 Samuel chapter 7. We're ending uh, a series called Burning in My Soul. And uh, if, the, if you're a guest to BCC, we're so glad you're here today. And uh, if you've missed uh, part of this series, you can go back on our website. You can watch or you can listen and uh, catch up with where we've been in Samuel. I have enjoyed the book of Samuel so much. It's just a special book of the Bible. And um, today I want to wrap up kind of where we've been. We talked about in week one about how to recognize God's presence. And what we did that I thought was so special is we really defined what God's presence is. We really tried to say if, if, if God's presence is something we aim for in our church as well as in our homes and in our marriages, well, then what does God's presence look like? And if you can't define it, then how do you know if you have it? And so we worked very hard to define what God's presence really means. And you can go back and listen to that. So week one was defining, uh, week one was called how to recognize God's presence. In week two, we were in 1 Samuel 3 when the Lord spoke to Samuel. And he didn't recognize God's voice. And the reason why is because the Bible says the Lord had not yet revealed himself to Samuel. And so we talked about what it means to know God's voice. How do you know it's the Lord speaking to you? How do you know it's God putting something on your heart and not just something you want to do? Well, we talked about in week two how to recognize God's voice. Today, to wrap up this series, I want to talk to you about how to recognize God's victories. How to recognize victory. Because I think, I, I talk to a lot of people and I do a lot of counseling. I think just this year alone, I've done 50 counseling sessions just in the first 10 months of the year. And I talk to a lot of people and I counsel with a lot of people. I pray with a lot of people. And do you know what I find over and over when it comes to believers, Christians? We like victory in our life. Whether it's addiction or whether it's depression or whether it's anxiety or whether it's being overwhelmed with life. There are so many issues that cause defeat in a Christian's life. There's so many things that we're burdened over. Illnesses and sickness and financial issues and job pressures. And there's so much that comes on our life that it's easy to get weighed down. And it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get overwhelmed. Well, I think what the key is for us to remember as Christians, and this is what I want to show us today, is how God will give us victory in our life. And why is this so important? If you're going to take notes today, I do, you should definitely write this down because this is a game changer for our lives. As believers, as Christians, we do not fight for victory. We fight because of victory. See, we miss it in our Christian life. We don't understand 1 Corinthians 15, 57, which says, But thanks be to God, who through Christ Jesus always gives us the victory. We miss this. Thanks be unto God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, as a believer, as a Christian, I'm not wanting God to give me victory. He's already promised me victory. So that's why I can resist Satan. That's why I can resist sin. That's why I can withhold through temptation. That's why I am a new creation and all things are new in my life. I don't have to be who I used to be. I don't have to walk those paths any longer. Why? Because I've been given the victory through Christ Jesus. But what happens when we start living that way? Well, that's what's, what happened with Israel. Look at, we'll just begin with verse number 3. And Samuel, this is chapter 7, 1 Samuel, verse 3. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you. And direct your heart to the Lord. Serve Him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. It's very interesting. Now watch what happens. Okay, so here they're getting serious about God. And if you're here today, and I don't care, first time in church, went to church a thousand times, perhaps you even attend every week. I, I, I'm not asking where you are in that spectrum. Here's what I'm asking. Are you serious about the Lord? Are you serious about God in your life? 
Or do you come in here week after week and enjoy the music and, and, and enjoy the teaching and enjoy the fellowship, but yet you're not serious about your spiritual life? You're not serious about putting sin away. See, that's what God measures today. God doesn't put a gold star every time we come to church. And they're like, my goodness, they came all summer long. Huh. I'm really impressed. They've really upped their game. That's not what God's looking at. God wants, listen, the Bible tells us he sees the heart. And if our heart is not directed toward the Lord, then our life isn't pleasing to him today. Are we serious about God? You say, Chad, what does it look like to get serious about God? We put away idols out of our life. I cannot fathom bowing down to a carven wooden statue. Like, we wouldn't do that in our culture. But you know as well as I know, we put a lot of things above the Lord, don't we? Come on, right? We put a lot of things above God. You know what that is? That's idolatry. That's idolatry. When we put our work above the Lord, when we put our interest above the Lord, when we put our hobbies above the Lord, that is called idolatry. And how do you get serious with God? You take out all the competition. You put away idols out of your life. Things that you care about, things that you're passionate about. It's okay to be passionate about things in your life, but not above your passion for the Lord. Not above what God has called you to do. Not above the things that the Lord wants you to be engaged in and active in. No, 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 no. That's an idol. And the Lord wants that out of our life. We repent from sin. We turn. We direct our hearts to the Lord. That's how we get serious about God. But watch what happened. Watch what happened. So here Israel is getting serious about the Lord. Verse number 5. Then Samuel said, gather all of Israel at Mizpah. And I will pray to the Lord for you. Remember what Samuel did? He was the only man in all of Israel's history to fulfill three offices at one time. Prophet, priest, and judge. He's second only to Moses in the influence of Israel's past. Samuel's big, 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 big. And he gathers all of Israel and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to repent. And watch what happens. Verse number six. So they gathered at Mizpah. And drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. So they're getting everything right. They're getting everything clean. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Do you see what happened there? When they got serious with God, that's when the enemy attacked. You realize it's no different in our own lives. As you get serious about the Lord and you move idols out of your life and you repent and you get clean and you begin to say, Lord, I want you to use my life. I want to honor you and I want to please you. I want to glorify you. I want you to be happy with the way that I live. You think Satan's going to stand by idol and let your family get right with the Lord? You think he's going to do that? Absolutely not. You know what's going to happen? Those principalities that Paul talked about, those sp- spiritual darkness that Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't fight flesh and blood. Our, uh, who do we fight? Spiritual darkness. Yes, when you get serious about the Lord, that spiritual darkness is going to hear about that. It's going to find out. And you know what? Satan's going to go pressing every button in your life that he knows to press. How many of you can testify that and say, that's right, that's true? How many of you have experienced that before, right? You know what it is for Satan to fight your family. You know what it is for him to attack you, to come against you. You know what it is for Satan to bring discouragement to your life. Well, this is what's going on with Israel. They're getting serious with the Lord and their enemies are hearing about it. And that's when they said, now is the time to attack. And watch what happens. Verse number six. Now remember, they're in a church service here. (laughs) They're, they're, they're at homecoming. I doubt they had food like that. But they're, I mean, you know, they've all gathered, right? They've all gathered themselves. And because they've gathered themselves, they're repenting. They're fasting. Well, definitely wasn't homecoming because they were fasting. <clears throat> Maybe the Lord will tell some of you to fast today. I hope he doesn't tell me until after like this evening. I'll be glad to fast this evening. (laughs) I'm kid. Verse number number 8. Now remember, they're gathered. They're fasting. 
They're repenting. This is a deeply, deeply spiritual moment. A spiritual moment like they haven't had in years and years and years. If you go back and you listen to the previous sermons, you remember when Hannah came and prayed such a prayer in chapter 1? The Bible says she prayed to the extent that her lips moved, but no words came out. And the Bible says that she poured out her heart to the Lord. And Eli, the high priest, the main man in charge of the spiritual direction of Israel, thought the woman was drunk. You know what that tells me? That tells me that Eli hadn't seen such praying in his lifetime. He hadn't seen someone call on the name of the Lord. Not like that. He couldn't even recognize true intercessory prayer because he hadn't seen it. This was a dry season in Israel. Chapter 3 verse 1 says that the word of the Lord was rare. And there were, that there were not frequent visions of the Lord. I mean he didn't visit his people. This was a dark time in Israel's history. Well now people are repenting. Now people are saying we've sinned against the Lord. There's a revival taking place. And Samuel's leading them in this beautiful repentance. And now they're about to get attacked by their enemies. So what did they do? What would you do if, 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 if uh, you know, you're in a great service like this today and ISIS was in downtown? What would we do? What would we do? Let's listen to what happens. Verse 9. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that, we may, that he may save us from the hand of of the Philistines. They didn't scatter. They didn't run. They didn't go home. They didn't flee. They came together and they called on the name of the Lord. Everybody look at me right now. I want you to get this. What do you do when Satan attacks your family? Let me tell you what you don't do. You don't run home. You don't isolate yourself. You don't isolate your family. You don't run away from the church. You run to the people of God. And you gather and you band together. And, you, and together we call on the name of the Lord on each other's behalf. Amen? See, there's a good crowd here today. But we're not interested in a crowd. We're a family. We're the church. We're the people of God. Amen? And we bear one another's burdens. And we lift each other up. And we pray for one another. We encourage one another. And that way, when Satan attacks your home, we're praying for you. When Satan attacks my home, I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. I've got people calling on the Lord on my behalf. Amen? What a difference that makes. You don't run away from the people of God. You run to the people of God. And what happens so often? We get overwhelmed. We get hurt. We get offended. For many of us, we simply get busy. And weeks turn into months and months turn into longer. And before we know it, we're out of church. And we're away from God's people. We're away from the people who know how to cry out to the Lord with us, for us. Don't let that happen to your family. It impresses me that when Israel heard, you're talking about true repentance. When Israel heard that the Philistines were on their way, they went to the man of God. They went to Samuel and said, don't cease to pray for us. Pray that God will deliver us today. Wow. Now watch, watch this. Verse number nine. Now this is a foreshadow. Watch what happens. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. Oh, isn't that special? Listen, do you have people who will cry out to the Lord on your behalf? Do you have people who will cry out to the Lord on your behalf? I'll never forget it. We, we, we had taken our worship team to Colorado Springs to a worship conference there and they were doing, you may know the song, Overcome. Buddy sings it a lot for us. And they were singing Overcome, and it was the church that wrote it. And it was brand new. It just came out. And, I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. And uh, we're in this massive church. There's probably like 5,000 people there that night. And they were doing Overcome. And it wasn't like a three-minute song. I mean, they did it for like 15, 18 minutes. And there was a family that I was so burdened for, so burdened for, so burdened for. And I will never forget that night calling out to the Lord. I'm not talking like, Lord, help them. You know, Lord, help them to get through this. Lord, will you, will you be with them? I'm talking deep, deep, 
deep intercessory prayer. I'm talking the kind that comes out of your spirit. And I'll never forget it. I will never forget it. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but, but let me tell you this. It was a family who were leaders in our church. They were leaders. And they, were, and they had sinned. And they were unrepentant of that sin. And they knew that they were unrepentant of that sin. And they knew it to the degree that they left the church because they knew they couldn't come here and be in a leadership position and be in the sin that they were in. And it was tough. It was breaking my heart. And I'm telling you, I called on the Lord like that up to that point like never before. And I remember after a while of praying, I remember feeling something change. It just in my heart, in my spirit, I knew something had happened. And I felt the Lord say, it's, it's broke through. It's okay. It's okay. It's done. It's done. We come back home and it was later that week. They showed up here at the church, weeping, repentant, and saying, we've sinned, we've sinned, and we need to repent from this. And you know what? The Lord fully, fully restored them, restored our relationship, and now we're great friends. Amen? They, they've moved on to out of, the, out of the state, but you know what? We still stay so close to one another. And, and what was the difference? The difference was crying out to the Lord. See, church, I can't tell you. I cannot emphasize this enough. And this is why this series has meant so much to me with the way that Hannah prayed and the way that Samuel heard from the Lord and talking about the presence of God and hearing God's voice and experience God's victories. Do you know why this is so important to me? It's because God has already given us the victory. There's no sense in us losing ground that's already been won. Do you hear that? There's no sense in losing ground that's already been won. But here is the crux of it. Here's the difference maker, okay? These battles are won or lost in prayer. That's where the victory is won. What happened when everybody in Israel should have been panicking? What did they do? They prayed. Do you see the difference? And instead of falling apart and running home and isolating themselves and every man's family for himself, they came together and they called on the name of the Lord. And it made all the difference in the world. Is that our perspective? Is that our attitude? Do we win the battles of our life through prayer? Because that's where it's won or lost. Now, let's finish this up. I think this is the shortest sermon I've ever preached. But we're not done yet, but <laughs> don't worry. It's Okay, so verse number 9. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a burnt offering. What's that, what, what, what's that a shadow of? It's a shadow of Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. See, how big is that death? Oh, Lord, I can't get into all this. I'm going to... Oh, it's this, this is so good. I, I, <laughs> real fast, as fast as I can, real fast. <laughs> See, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, 14, and 15, what's it say? That the record of death that stood against us with all its legal demands, this he set aside, how? By nailing it to the cross. And then it says, listen to what it says. And then he put them to open shame, triumphing over them through the death of the cross. What's that mean, triumphing over them? What's that mean, put them to open shame? See, it was the sacrifice of Christ. It was his death on the cross that gives us every spiritual victory of our lives. And you say, Chad, what's that look like? Well, see, every problem that you and I have in life is a spiritual problem. You say, oh, you're just making everything churchy. No, 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 no. Every problem we have is a spiritual problem. Do you know why? Because you're not a body that has a soul. You're a soul that happens to have a body for a short period of time. Because you're created in the image of God... And because you are a soul, that means you're spiritual. All of you are spiritual. So every problem you have is a spiritual problem. Addiction is a spiritual problem. Loneliness is a spiritual problem. Depression is a spiritual problem. Anxiety is a spiritual problem. All of the problems of our life are spiritual. And that's why when Christ died on the cross and he promised us victory, it applies to every facet, every area, every situation of our life. He will give you the victory in. Amen? 
So what do you got to do? You got to do what Samuel did. He, he, he sacrificed this lamb. Listen, Christ has been sacrificed one time, Hebrews says, for all of eternity. And his blood is able to atone for everything in our life. So what do we got to do? We got to claim the blood in our life. We got to claim Christ's victory. We have to say, thank you, God. I know that you died on the cross on my behalf. And I accept that victory in Jesus' name. Now, now, okay, that's closing number one. Closing number two. This is where we're going to finish. Verse number nine. Verse number ten. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord. Are you hearing this? But the Lord. But the Lord. What does the Bible say? The, Lord's, the Bible says the Lord will fight for us. Right? The Lord will fight for us. You, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to go to bat alone. You don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You don't have to. to no, no, no. The Lord will fight for you. You just need to let God be God. Amen? So look what he says. The Philistines drew near and the Lord thundered. A mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. He threw them into confusion and they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far below as Bethkar. What is the point? The point is God did a supernatural working in their life that day. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this same victory that happened thousands of years ago. Listen, God's still active today in our life. Amen? And he can do supernatural things in our life. But when do those things happen? See, what happens so often is we want the Lord to move in our life. We want him to do something special for us. But there's still idols there, so God's silent. There's still sin present, so God is silent. We ask the Lord to help us. We ask the Lord to change things. But the idols and the sin is still there. Do you see the natural progression of what happened? Israel got the idols out. They repented. They directed their hearts to the Lord. And then when trouble came, they were able to call upon the Lord. Why? Because they had truly repented. Have you truly, truly repented? I mean done a 180. I mean have you directed your heart Toward the Lord. That's when the help will come in your life. That's when the Lord will step in. That's when he'll do supernatural things. So watch what Samuel does. The Lord brings a mighty victory that day. In verse number 12. Then Samuel took a stone. And set it up between Mizpah and Shin. And called its name Ebenezer. For he said till now. The Lord has helped us. Oh what a special verse. You know, in the first song we sang today was Come Thou Fount. And there's a line in Come Thou Fount that always scratched my head at. And it says, here I raise my Ebenezer. What's that mean? What is an Ebenezer? Well, this is a Hebrew word. And it means stone of help. You know what Samuel did? Samuel set up a monument that day that the Lord was faithful. That the Lord helped them. What a special thing. You know, I want to ask you today. If you get the idols out of the way, you get sin out of your life. The Lord will help you. How will you celebrate? Some of us, and see, that's one reason why hymns are so special to many of us. Because in many ways, they're monuments. In many ways, they're Ebenezer's. We can look back over our life. One of the songs that means so much to me is, Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. See, it was a season in my life where my soul was so thirsty. And it says, come and quench the thirstings of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole. See, for my life, I can look back to 2005, 2006, 2007. I can look back over that season of struggle. I can look back over that season of doubt, that season of worry. And, I, and see, that song has become an Ebenezer to me. That song got me through. That song encouraged me in the Lord. And I would sing it to the Lord and I could feel him working in my heart. And and now I look back on the other side of it all. And what is it? That's an Ebenezer. That's a stone of help to me that the Lord helped me. What will be your Ebenezer? I don't know. But I'll tell you where it begins. It begins by getting sin out of your life. It begins by putting away the idols. It begins by getting serious with the Lord and directing your heart toward the Lord. I hope that you'll do just that. 
Will you bow your heads with me today? They're going to take our lights down. And as they do, Charles and Lori are going to come and they're going to lead us in how great thou art. But as we make this transition, just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you, have you gotten sin out of your life? Well, you know what? This is the house of God today. What a great place. What a great place to just renew your heart. What a great place to just make things between you and the Lord fresh. What a great place. So as they sing this wonderful song, I'm going to invite you to pray. You can sing along with them. But I want you to pray. I want you to pray. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you need to think back to that time in your life where God did something supernatural. God did something special for you. Now, as they sing, if you want to come to this altar and pray, oh, you're welcome to. You can kneel right down in front of the pumpkins. That's just perfect. It's no problem. You're welcome to come pray. But listen, God wants to work in our lives today. Amen? He wants to work in our lives. And when Israel repented and let God work, that's when God did work. So if you're here today and you're frustrated because you say, Chad, I have prayed. I have asked for help. I have asked God to step in. Well, let me ask you this. Have you truly repented? Have you gotten the idols out? Have you gotten the sin out? That's step one. Lord, help us today as we continue the rest of our service and we finish out with these last few songs. Lord, I pray that you'll work in our hearts in a beautiful way. In Jesus' name, amen.